Leon, Mary Beth, Veronica, Jeff, and Drew Hinks. The future of crypto regulation. I'll make you a bet you didn't expect that kind of intro on the regulation panel. So it's the first day of TNABC, and we get to the crypto and regulatory panel. Maybe it's not the sexiest part of the conference, but it might be the most important. Because regulation, it really, it, it outlines what we can or can't do with these assets and systems and products that we talk about every day. My name is Drew Hinkus. I'm a partner at the law firm of k &L Gates. I'm an adjunct professor at the New York University School of Law and School of Business, and I'm delighted to welcome you to today's regulatory panel, which is the future of regulation. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm going to allow, or I'm going to very quickly um, introduce our panelists here. Let's start with the gentleman to my left, Jeff Howard. He is the head of North America Business Development and Institutional Sales at OSL. Previously, Jeff was a managing director at both Merrill Lynch and RBS, where he ran North American Futures and Options and Global Prime Services, respectively. A veteran of regulated and emerging markets, prior to joining OSL, Jeff launched a successful cannabis VC fund. Next, we've got Veronica McGregor. She started by giving talks to Bitcoin to confused and skeptical banking lawyers. In 20, and has spent 20 years in big law representing fintech companies before going in-house as the chief legal officer at Shapeshift. She's the first lawyer I know that has successfully decentralized herself out of a job, leading to the formation of Shapeshift's DAO. She's now the chief legal officer at Exodus. And next, we've got Mary Beth Buchanan, the president of Merkel Science Americas and the company's chief or global chief legal officer. Before joining Merkel, she was the chief legal officer at Bitstamp, general counsel at Kraken, and a partner at Brian Cave, where she began, began representing crypto companies in late 2013. Mary Beth spent the first 21 years of her career at the U.S. Department of Justice and served as the presidentially appointed U.S. Attorney for the Western District of Pennsylvania from 2001 to 2009. Last and certainly not least, all the way to the left, we've got uh, Liat, who is a senior advisor for crypto policy and regulation at blockchain and analytics company Elliptic. She's based out of New York and previously has been with the Edgemont Group of Financial Intelligence Units, Citibank, and has worked for various companies on Capitol Hill. Liad has spent the last 15 years building anti-money laundering programs in Africa and the Middle East and follows the philosophy that financial inclusion and financial integrity go hand in hand. So now that you know us all really well, let's jump right in. DeFi has been a huge force for excitement and flood of new capital into crypto since DeFi summer in 2020. It's created new opportunities to engage in familiar financial transactions like trading and lending and um, obtaining yields on products without using traditional intermediaries. It's something of a spiritual inheritor to Bitcoin in that sense. But the writing's on the wall. DeFi regulation is coming. So the first question for the panel, what is DeFi regulation gonna look like? Happy to kick us off. Uh, thanks for that. So I think one thing that we've learned from historical regulatory activities is that they'll cut and paste anything from fiat. So I think what we can expect is that we'll see many of the same concepts around know your customer, beneficial ownership, due diligence, these kind of same compliance anti-money laundering concepts that we know and love from fiat be cut and paste into crypto into crypto firms' responsibilities and obligations. And what that really means for us is that we need to be well positioned to understand these concepts, innovate where we need to in order to bridge that gap between compliance and regulatory expectations and what DeFi projects aim to do. And that's, I think, where the big gap is. So we know that the regulation's probably gonna look like regulation we've seen in other contexts. But I think that we're sort of cheating with the question because DeFi is this sort of big bucket term. And DeFi means different things to different people. In certain circumstances, DeFi might mean just moving around stakeholders. And in other circumstances, it might mean you've got a completely new structure for a business where there isn't some party in the middle. Is there a difference 
in how we should expect to see regulation of really decentralized businesses versus those that might be dinos or decentralized in names only? Uh, Veronica, maybe you want to take that? Right, the dinos. Um, yeah, so as you all know, decentralization is really a continuum, right? It's, there's some that's, you know, more centralized and some that's incredibly just a, a group of individuals. Um, you know, my most recent experience, um, you know, is to have taken a centralized entity and turned it into a decentralized entity by, we moved our trading platform, uh, turned it over to token holders for the Shapeshift DAO, and we just wound down the centralized company. So now the DAO is being run by token holders of our native token, the Fox token. So here's the thing, um, you know, so who, who do you regulate, right? That's the big magic question in, in all things DeFi, but especially DAOs, is who are you gonna regulate? Um, and uh, what I basically believe to be the case is that if wrongdoing is suspected, that a regulator will go after whoever is benefiting from the project, right? Be it a, a DEX or some other DeFi protocol or DAO, you know, whatever it is, if there is some wrongdoing suspected by one regulator, they will therefore look to whoever's benefiting from it. <clears throat> and if, if it's like not any single, and then it might be who created these smart contracts because the common argument is, look, these are all just smart contracts talking to each other. There is no person, there, it's just contracts. And I, you know, I, I just don't think that's gonna fly. Yeah, I, I agree with what Veronica said. Uh, regulators always want to find someone yeah. who is responsible. Um, what we saw, I think, after the first, uh, the first DAO, when the SEC came out with its DAO report in 2017, they wanted to start holding the lawyers responsible. So anyone who may have helped advise uh, an ICO or helped advise uh, associated with the DAO, they, they wanted to hold, hold someone accountable. And in this case with DeFi, I think that the FATF has even suggested that maybe the the programmers, the, the you know the the person who wrote the code, you know sh should be responsible. So that leads to the really interesting question of: Are those who create code with the intention of then modifying it so that control over that code is decentralized among a diffuse group of people, will they ultimately be held liable for what happens under the theory of? you made the trick box, you opened it and let it out, even if you can't control what it does now, you're responsible for setting all of those things into motion. Yeah, um, I think, um, well, first of all, I think when it comes to DAOs, I think this year we're going to see a lot more enforcement action. I think the poly market fine and cease and desist order was like just the first shot across the bow because they're gonna set an example early on this year. Um, and I think the problem is, is that we got to define what a DAO is, right? Like, you, we speak about how to regulate it. We can't speak about how, to, how we regulate it until we define actually what it is. It looks like a corporation. It looks like a partnership. It looks like an LLC. It looks like all these things. And so until we determine what it is, we can't really regulate it well. And so I think that we have to, when we're trying to define it, we have to define it first. But then also I think you have to separate the treasury function uh, from the protocol function. And it kind of gets to your question, right? Protocol function, um, I don't think you get in any crosshairs. The treasury function, if you're, if you're issuing tokens and, and they're considered you know, unregistered securities, that's when you cross the line and you have a problem. So it's a matter of defining it. Is it, is it, is it a corporation? What is it? Most of what's going on now in the US, in the state of Wyoming, they're creating these unincorporated, um, unincorporated, um, uh, association, unincorporated um, LLCs. LLCs that they're creating in Wyoming to get, a, to get, to get around this. So Wy Wyoming's kind of on the cutting edge, but again, I think it needs to find what type of legal entity it is before we decide how to regulate it. But I don't know that you, there's not a one-size-fits-all definition of a, of a DAO when you say we need to define what it is. Like I said, there are so many different types of decentralizing something and different varying levels of what parts are centralized and what parts are decentralized that it'd be really hard to cram all those into one specific one definition no, no, yeah no not the same de definition but we like the legal entity we have to we have to define the legal entity before we know who's going to regulate it but if it's an entity then it's not truly decentralized so what we're talking about here is this sort of big concept of what's a DAO DAOs are huge now 
they back up NFT issuance, they back up DeFi companies that spin their protocols off and claim that their hands are no longer on it. And really, we're talking about two different things. We have states like Vermont and Wyoming that have created laws that recognize incorporated legal entities as DAOs. And they are legally addressable, which means they can sue and be sued. And you essentially have people that are using smart contracts to perform the governance and the management of assets that you would normally see uh, happen in a business entity anyhow. The other kinds of DAOs and the types that I think are more interesting for this discussion are loose groups of people that don't choose to legally incorporate, that use specific tools, in this case smart contracts and wallets and quadratic voting, in order to affect rights to digital assets or powers over digital assets. And that second group of DAOs, those that are not legally incorporated, are to me much more interesting because the question of who would a regulator go after, who's actually responsible for what happens to those digital assets, seems to be a really open question. Does anyone have any thoughts on that? One thing that, I, that sort of leads my nose when it comes to compliance and regulatory frameworks is who can you sue? And who can you build a case against? And, and I think that one of the things that we're going to see is that um, as long as you can create an evidence trail and bring it to justice and to the Department of Justice and make cases out of it, I think that's what's going to happen in terms of setting precedents and in terms of DAOs. And it comes to not just the particular DAO, but the enablers of that DAO in terms of um, what nonprofit organizations, what non-governmental organizations are supporting that. You know, we saw, we saw this come to light and, and there were congressional discussions around um, uh, the, the sale of the US Constitution and that put it smack in the middle of, of you know, the regulatory site. So you can bet that there's a lot of discussion right now um, happening on, on NFTs and DAOs and, and, and DeFi, and it's not going to slip. But I, I think if what we've learned from the past is that we're going to see a few hallmark cases that are going to be hammered out. They're gonna set a, pre a precedent. They're gonna be pursued and fined and enforced. And we're all gonna look at the side and say, you know, we told you so. Bring your compliance in early on into your development, into your programs, into protocols. Um, we are here as a compliance community to enable business growth. We're not just the police woman on the corner, you know, waving our finger at you. We want to sit at your developer table and help guide your business towards growth and compliance. Yeah, but I'm concerned. So I don't disagree, by the way, with what you just said. Um, and um, what, what this industry wants, of course, is regulation that we can work with. Um, but regulation by enforcement is always, you know, a, a scary thing for everyone. And I'm sad to say, I believe this year is going to be full of that. I'm yeah, not, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I think that the DeFi issue, um, what regulators are really concerned about is who is doing the KYC mm -hmm. for people who are participating in the decentralized finance. And so the, whoever can figure that out, I think is going to ease the concerns that regulators have. And so there has to be a way built into, uh, you know, the, the smart contract, a way to know, uh, you know, who's using the token, that, that there has been some KYC on the participants. And there, there are ways to do this, and I think that that might satisfy the regulators that this can be done safely uh, without having a traditional financial institution, you know, overseeing the transaction. So maybe we should draw a distinction between DAOs that exist as clubs or affinity groups or participatory ventures that are not in, of a financial nature versus those that financialize their governance or financialize their operations. I think it's pretty clear that if you're using a DAO as a way of associating without a financial or investment purpose, you've got different considerations than if you're basically just redoing the DAO, which was a decentralized VC fund. And Jeff's comment about splitting up the operational versus the treasury management part, part is well taken. Um, but really what I think we're hearing here on the panel is this whole idea of a DAO is so amorphous and so varied in the way that it's being designed that there's going to be a difficulty in coming up with hard and fast rules that would apply to each of them. Liad? Yeah, can I just add one quick point? I, I think the nearest point of reference that regulators are going to have are, are crowdfunding platforms that we've seen and loved and developed and grow already in the space. And I think that's going to be the first point of reference in terms of how it is that the regulation of DAO, um, DAOs in, get evolved and, and developed. So that would be kind of, if you're, if you're working in this space, that would be something that you know, is worth having a look at. So perfect segue to get to our second topic, which is actually stable coins. 
Since the invention of some early stable coins, we've seen a variety of different approaches to creating a digital asset that more or less stays at a set value. These assets have become important for the payments infrastructure, for remittances, and for DeFi. Um, and they have emerged as perhaps a legitimate challenger to the US dollar, which of course brings on a whole bunch of government scrutiny. We've known since 2020, when there was a statement issued by the Treasury under the Trump administration, that stablecoin regulation is coming. Despite the change in regime, the Biden administration seems just as likely, if not more so, uh, to come up with some sort of stablecoin regulation. What do we expect here? Let me kick this to Mary Beth to start. Well, there has definitely been a lot of interest in stablecoins uh, at the end of last year, and we're going to see more of it this year. Uh, the, both the House and the Senate held hearings to try to learn about stablecoins. I would say maybe the House was more interested in learning, and I think that the Senate uh, members who participated were sort of staking out their own positions. But learn they must do, because uh, you know stablecoins uh, are here to stay, and, and many people are using them, and I think they're recognizing that a lot of their constituents are interested in cryptocurrency, and so they need to learn about this, and they need to come up with regulation that's going to make sense. So probably the worst thing they could do is to say that only the central bank can issue a stablecoin. The next worst thing would be to say that only um, certain uh, federally regulated financial institutions can issue stable coins. What I hope they will do, and, and what I think many in the, in the industry hope, is that they'll come up with some common sense ways to solve the issues that they're concerned about. So the biggest issue with the stable coin is, you know, is it really backed? And so that's something that I think they should look at, and they should look at how to protect, you know, the public who's using stable coins. And so one way to do that is to set some type of parameters around what type of collateral uh, can be used, um, what type of assets can serve as collateral, and how can those assets be, be measured and monitored and audited. So I think even the participants in the space right now think that that's a good idea. And so as long as Congress continues to engage with the community, engage with you know, the companies that are creating the stable coins, and engage with people who are using stable coins, they'll be able to come up with a way to, to satisfy some of those issues, but allow the innovation to continue and, and not to put it all in the hands of a regulated financial institution, because that was never the intent uh, when stable coins were created, and it's certainly not consistent with the whole um, theory and policy with, with cryptocurrency. Right, and, and since stable coins are so like intricately interwoven into lots of DeFi, um, the regulation of, of stable coins will affect DeFi as well, like tremendously. We, we have a fundamental role to play as an industry, from my perspective, in uh, liaising with government and creating public-private partnerships that really enable this. And, and I think this is the time where we have to step in to help congressional um, entities and, and other regulators shape the stablecoin narrative. I think it's a force against what we've been seeing in terms of, of you know, the US dollar concerns, the demise, the rise. Um, Chinese foreign policy concerns and stablecoins are being discussed in the same sort of you know, halls in the same rooms. And there's a great deal for us to be able to influence. And there's a lot of great work being done in Washington and otherwise by, by different associations that are really leading the force. And as individual companies um, operating in this space, I think we can do a lot more to demonstrate the, the, the variety of voices. It's not just stable coins as one topic. There are multiple layers to this, and, and we can all play a role. You know, I think it's important to note that you know, stable coins are used everywhere in the world. And even if uh, the Congress would create some new regulation here in the U.S., stablecoins are not going to go away. And, and so we, we need to figure out how the U.S. can participate in the ecosystem and, and again, just develop some, some common sense rules that will solve the concerns that uh, our regulators have. Yeah, I mean, I, I, totally, uh, I totally agree with that. And stablecoins, you know, as most of everybody knows in the room here, I mean, the interoperability interoperability of, of the coins themselves and the stable coins have just given rise to a tremendous amount of liquidity and a tremendous amount of volume that wouldn't be there otherwise. So it has grown so large now that the regulators are scared to death of it. Um, and so 
The president's, I'm just, this, is just, this, is, this is not my opinion, I'm just giving you information. The president's working group on stable coins that they've given now to Congress, effectively, if you read letter by letter, says that they're not going to let anybody issue a stable coin unless they're an FDIC insured uh, institution, right? Because they want that because in times of crisis, they want access, they want to give these stable coin operators access to the, uh, to the Fed window for emergency liquidity. So if you read the letter of the law, it's going to say that it's only going to be uh, issued by FDIC uh, regulated entities. So if we do enter a world where the regulators tell us that there's a group of persons that are regulated that can issue stable coins that are okay to use in the United States, how is that going to affect the algorithmic stable coins, those that are created by vaults? those that are created by operation of code, operated by DAOs, that maybe don't have a legally addressable entity that can be forced to comply with that kind of law. Do we think that there will be some sort of crackdown, or is a crackdown even possible? Yeah, I, I definitely think uh, that, that that would be a significant issue. I mean, the algorithmic stablecoin is a great idea from certain, uh, certain perspectives to, you know, to be able to always monitor the price and never let it get, you know, too low, too high, you know, that's all great. But the piece obviously that's missing is the, uh, the collateral backing. And if I were a betting person, I, I think that once the regulators begin to put regulation in place, they're not going to leave the algorithmic stable coins alone. And they'll try to find some way uh, to ban the use of those. So I think if the algorithmic coins, uh, if, if they can monitor and participants can look at the supply and find a way to keep the, um, you know, the dollar value stable, then there's probably a way that they can come up with uh, a, a fluctuating uh, collateral backing. And so I, I'm definitely rooting for uh, all of the innovators out there to come up with a way to do that. And so that's, that's my hope. And I think a, a big theme that's emerging at the moment is, is really buzzing around consumer protections. How are we going to protect consumers from advertising, from scams, from frauds? Um, and, and there's a variety of, of projects that are coming out. How do we vet these? And I think these are the questions that we're, we're seeing being tackled in regulatory halls. Um, and consumer protections is just going to keep kind of, you know, market manipulation. All these topics are going to be huge um, and, and, and very much, you know, being addressed. And, and, and I think it's important, like, who, who ends up regulating stable coins, like which regulatory body uh, actually does it. There's, I mean, I think everyone's in agreement. Regulation's going to happen whether we like it or not. Um, I think if the SEC had their way, they would want to regulate stable coins. Uh, in fact, Gary Gensler has changed the term to stable value coins because it sounds like stable value funds, which he's able to regulate. But uh, I think ideally, I think it should be regulated by, um, uh, by the Fed and the OCC. I think that's more appropriate than the SEC. So, so the who should regulate question is a multifaceted one. There's an argument to be made that if Liat's correct and the concern really is consumer protection, then maybe the CFPB should do something here. That's another uh, a regulatory and enforcement body that has in its charge protecting consumers and they have been incredibly quiet about crypto. I don't know that we can bet that they're going to stay quiet for long, but it's an organization that has the uh, ability to perhaps claim back a little turf from what's otherwise been taken by some of our three and four letter uh, um, enforcers here. I see, I see a lot of yeah. nods yeah. on the panel here. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I was just gonna mention, uh, you know, Elizabeth Warren, she's not a big fan of the industry, um, and that's her agency, and she's tight with Gary Gensler. Uh, so I wouldn't be surprised to see some more enforcement and, um, like you said, kind of turf clawed back. Yeah, absolutely. The, uh, the current director definitely has um, this industry in his sights. It's been widely discussed you know, in the industry. Yeah, that's all. I'm just saying that the CFPB or whatever acronym they're going by now is definitely <laughs> going to be active probably this year. You know, I think it's really important to remember that you know, while there are many different, particularly federal agencies that want to jump in and claim the authority to regulate, it's not really up to the regulators to decide that, it's up to Congress. And I think that the Supreme Court has, has addressed this issue that 
regulators can't just take power. It has to be given to them. It has to be given to them by the members of Congress that we elect. And this is a, probably a, a showdown that will also come up, but I would ex fully expect that this uh, is going to stay within the hands of, of Congress and, and everyone can influence this decision. And so know who your member of Congress is, know who your senator is, let them know what you think because that's the reason that they act. They act because they know that their constituents care and their constituents have views on this. So definitely get out there, get active, and um, you know, put your input, give them your input. True, but a lot of the agencies already have very broad regulatory authority granted to them by Congress, so. Right, if they already have it. Yeah, something a lot of them do. I would not interpret regulatory uh, agency silence as not paying attention, as not addressing it. I would interpret it as a learning curve. I think there is not a single federal um, state agency right now that is not consumed by the learning curve that is crypto, which is why, again, I come back to this point of, you know, this is a wonderful opportunity for us to step in and help with the education process and um, uh, bring in these points around, you know, what is unique to the technology that enables regulation, that makes crypto safe, and we have to say it until we're blue in the face. I mean, I have the same talking points that I go on and on about, and I just, I think this is, this is the moment that we have to seize and help educate. I think anyone who's quiet now from a regulatory perspective, we hope we don't hear from them when it's time to enforce or define, but rather when it's time to guide and expand the sandbox. And I think that's, they're all gonna put pipe up at some point, and then we're gonna go into the turf battle over who regulates what, but they're educating themselves now. Yeah, I definitely agree with Liot that our U.S. regulators are working at it. Uh, they're developing different types of labs to have the industry come in and, and talk to them. They're, they're listening, they're learning. Um, but it's, it's important to note, though, that those staffs turn over uh, pretty quickly. And so just because you may have participated in some type of a regulatory education, doesn't mean that you can stop there. It's really a continuous education so that um, the new members of the staff can, can, can get the benefit of, of your wisdom and guidance. Well, we're hiring them, aren't we? They're all coming over to crypto. They, go, they work at the Senate, then they come over to crypto, and that's it. The person you educated is gone. So if your business, your livelihood, what, what excites you when you wake up in the morning involves these assets and these products that we've been talking about, you really should be interested in what's going on in Capitol Hill. You should be interested in what's going on at your state capitol. And apart from being interested in reading and educating yourself, how do people in the industry reach out to government? What's, how do they do this? <laughs> Very carefully. <laughs> Money. Quietly. Money. So uh, yeah, a, a lobby, lot of folks, I think is what you're saying by money, right? Right. So there's always the chance as a company to hire a lobbyist that has relationships with staffers and that is able to communicate with government. But I think there's another opportunity that's maybe being missed by our industry here. And that is the ability for folks to get together and to coalesce around issues and to have a coordinated position. Because a few disparate voices in the room probably don't get a lot of attention. But a well-organized campaign of education industry-wide or industry sector-wide would seem to me to be a, a more effective way to go. Yeah, and I think we saw a lot of progress last year uh, for industry lobbying groups and industry associations that came together to fight against the infrastructure bill that's bad for our industry. Uh, and so I think you saw, because at the end of the day, it is lobbying. <laughs> It's not bribery, but it's campaign donations. I mean, there's, there's a process. There's a process in DC uh, that involves money. How that process works, I'm not involved, but, uh, but uh, and, so, and, so, and so, yeah, so, you know. In, Just as an I, additional I, I, I perspective to the bribery, yeah. So I think no another, bribery. No bribery. I didn't say bribery. Yeah, keep your project we're, safe. We're not pro bribery. But, but just as another suggestion is office hours. So many of these agencies right now are offering, as part of their educational process, open office hours. You sign up, you pick a time slot, you present whatever it is that you want to present of your project, and you get feedback. And you know, that's, that's a, a double-edged sword, because you could be opening yourself up for more questions, or you could be actually getting helpful information that will, will inform your product to be uh, in alignment. The other piece, too, is that um, many of the agencies have to be uh, 
presenting about this, writing about these topics, and so they quote. They quote papers, they quote reports, they quote white papers. Um, they've started to quote crypto Twitter um, in some cases. So, so the more kind of vocal and, uh, uh, and you know, the more the associations put information out there, I think it's, it's just helping the maturity of the, of the industry. But the office hours are a really great opening. And sometimes, you know, I, I talk to regulators and they say nobody showed up. Nobody wanted to share our projects with us. You can't blame industry, but you can also say there's an opportunity there. Seize it. But one of the, the reason people don't show up is because, as you said, it's a double-edged sword. You show up and you tell them what you're going to do, and you have to live with the answer you get. Um, and that is scary because, you know, <laughs> that's a trust the exercise. The everything you're doing. It's, it's a trust exercise, right? From one meeting. So. Yeah, I st yeah, I think all those are great ideas. And uh, at the end of the day, I, can't, I think campaign donations go a long way. <laughs> So a last question on the stablecoin front. Let's assume that there is going to be some sort of regulation of stablecoins. How much of this is related to an eventual central bank digital currency play by the US government? Are they essentially clearing the field for their own competitor? Or are they really concerned that the, these assets won't keep their pegs and that US consumers using these products are going to be hurt? Is this a, is this a really kind of plowing the field so it's fertile for a US digital dollar, or is this really about protecting consumers here? You know, I think that the central, bank, central banks have always had the ability to create their own uh, cryptocurrency. And the more they learn about it, the more they may want to. But that doesn't mean that there's still not a place for privately created and issued stable coins. And they should, you know, watch the industry, and if they want to you know, come and play, they can, but they shouldn't try to keep everyone else off the field. So you've heard us over and over talk about how various regulators think about these assets differently. If you like to read about law the way that I do, you can find a case that says that Bitcoin is money. You can read tax guidance that says that Bitcoin is property. You can read the CEA and you'll be sure that Bitcoin is a commodity. And if you ask the former chairman of the SEC, they all look like securities to him. We've talked about how stable coins potentially could be regulated by justice, by the CFTC, by the SEC, and by bank regulators. Our assets are confusing to the government because they don't look like, smell like, or act like traditional instruments that are issued by financial institutions and actors in the financial markets. This can create some serious headaches for users and businesses that use these assets. Is the US doing this right? Is there anywhere that's doing it better? I think a lot of the regulators um, around the globe are doing a, a better job. And they're able to do it because in certain countries that have recently, like within the last few years, created regulatory frameworks, they've done it from one particular regulator. And so the, the regulator in certain countries, like you know Singapore, Abu Dhabi, they, they develop a comprehensive regulatory framework that looks at the character of the asset and how the asset is used. And I think that works very well in places that don't have so many different regulators. But here in the US, unless they come together and unless Congress creates more clear lines, we're going to see some hesitancy, I think, from the mainstream financial institution and from some, some you know, crypto companies. Wherever there's uncertainty, companies are going to be hesitant to, to jump into the market. And unless we in the U.S. Uh, develop more comprehensive uh, and clear regulatory guidance, we might see uh, more companies doing more active business in, in other countries. And that would never be a good thing for the U.S. Um, I want to I want to add I've been speaking at this conference since 2015 and every single time we have the question and the same answer which is in the US we have several federal regulators that want to claim this as their turf we have all the states many of whom decide to claim it as their turf um, and that is what makes it so difficult to comply on top of the fact that the regulation that's out there isn't clear or clearly applicable uh, and so therefore, absolutely, I would concur that this is not the best place to have a crypto business.
Yeah, we, we, you know, we, my company, we're super, super supportive of regulation. We work with the regulators, but right now, I mean, it is a learning curve for the regulators here in the U.S., but, you know, securities laws that were put in place 80 years ago, like before computers were, were, were made, it's not really applicable to today's, you know, uh, crypto economy. Uh, so I think, I think there's a lot of work to do. I do think there are other jurisdictions where it makes it easier for crypto firms to operate and, and do business. Um, but again, I think we need to modernize our, uh, our securities um, laws. So how do we make that happen? Campaign donations. <laughs> I, I, think, I think Jeff brought his checkbook with him. If anybody's raising, might want to hit him up. No, but seriously, how do, we, how do we make this happen? How do we, how do we start to push for change? So, so I sometimes think about this as, a, as prenuptial agreements. You kind of have to get into the details. And, and the details in this particular situation is that you know, we're, we're, we're measuring things against the Howey test, against the Reeves test. We're, sort of, we're, we're using almost antiquated constructs and concepts that don't quite apply to virtual assets in this particular asset class. And, and a very you know, initial place to start will be to modernize those and get into the details of the prenuptial agreement so that we can actually tackle it. And I think you know, if, if we come together with sort of a task force and advisory council that just quickly demolishes the operational of, of, of definitions, that, that could either go very well or bring us back to donations and, and bribery. So Jeff's running for office, I think. <laughs> so, so nobody got the correct answer. The correct answer is vote. In the United States, we get the chance to select our government. If you think that this is an issue that matters to you, talk to your representatives that are running. Let them know it's important to you as a voter, you as an employer, you as an important part of the economy, and vote. You are voting for the people who make decisions that affect your life. So one last point on the whole Crypto is scary and weird to regulators, so everybody wants to own it. NFTs have just exploded. And while NFTs on a technical basis might be a specific type of digital asset that can be traced from its creation through each holder to the current holder, they're really being used as a way to revolutionize delivery of content, the creator economy, and to facilitate all sorts of new participatory schemes involving digital assets. Many of these are just art. Many of these look sort of more like other types of financial assets. And because digital assets themselves only have legal meaning, when the issuer gives them legal meaning, there are probably NFTs out there that are securities, NFTs that are swaps, and NFTs that are just new forms of cool art. How and when do we think NFT regulation is coming? Let me kick this over to Liat to start. Sure. So, so NFTs at the moment are operating in a bit of a regulatory vacuum. There is a declared kind of global perspective from regulators that I've heard repeatedly, and it's been committed to paper, so it must be true, which is that they're, they're standing and waiting to see the behaviors and how this translates into potential illicit typologies, into potential money laundering. I've, the latest I've heard is potential espionage cases where you would embed um, uh, materials into an NFT that will then be brought over and exchanged between countries as mechanisms of espionage. So, so, so at the moment, there's a wait and see approach. Um, I, I think it's, it's again an opportunity for us to, to step in and, and, and support there uh, with, with helping shape that, that conversation. But um, when it will be time to regulate, I think it will come around a specific case, a big money laundering case. Um, I will point out very quickly that um, OFAC, who is responsible for enforcing sanctions, um, did sanction and list a wallet that had um, a, a board ape. Um, uh, NFT in that particular wallet associated with sanctions, and we've been tracking this at Elliptic, and it's, it's, it's really um, quite mind-blowing to see the connections between a regulator that's immediately sanctioned an NFT. At the same time, I had a regulator just the other week ask me, um, you know, what's the deal with these um, uh, monkey pictures? So <laughs> I think that you've got a spectrum. You know, I would take a slightly different view. I, I wouldn't say that there are I wouldn't say that there's a regulatory vacuum because, you know, an NFT, like any other business, whoever is selling, you know, selling the NFT, taking assets, 
you need to know your business. You need to know your customers. You need to know where's the money coming from that's going into the NFT. And so there's still a responsibility for you know, compliance 101. It's no different than you know, in the old days when um, you know, people in the drug trade would launder money by buying a bunch of cars. And so the car dealer needs to know, why is the same guy or gal coming in every week you know, buying a $70,000 car or a $100,000 car? So you need to know your customer. You need to know what the source of funds are. And fortunately, there are blockchain analytics companies out there that can screen the wallet addresses. And so there's a lot more tools available today and so many that are in, in the you know, analytics space that can help companies to make sure that their businesses aren't used for illegal purposes. I, I agree with the, both of those things, but I also think that, that the um, consumer protection aspect is going to get um, some traction on, with NFTs for sure. Um, and you know, so I believe that we'll have some potential enforcement over that. Fantastic. So we've got about five minutes left, and I wanted to give our panelists each an opportunity to talk about something that they think is really important or to cover something that maybe they wanted to say in response to another question. Just a quick minute, and then also if you wanted to tell the crowd how they can find you if they want to follow up or thought you said something really smart or want to ask you a question. Start with Liad. So um, in terms of takeaways, I mean, one thing that I love to do as a personal exercise is I'll sit down with the U.S. budget and I'll see where money's going and what it's, it's supporting. And I can tell that there's been a big spike in commitment to supervision efforts, to enforcement efforts, to trainings of supervisors. So I think there's going to be a lot more um, action coming towards us in terms of enforcement. And I know we've, we've kept saying this, but what that translates into practically is that we need to have our ducks in a row in terms of, you know, making sure that we've assessed our risks, we've um, applied some sort of risk mitigation program towards those risks, that we've designated a compliance officer within our business, that we know where and how money is going, um, and, and, and you know, concept of know your customer, you, that you've thought about these things. Um, the other thing I would say is that um, it's, it's wonderful to innovate, and I, I, I hope that we explode in innovation year and years to come, um, and that we stay in the, in the US uh, when possible. There's a big concept of regulatory arbitrage that we're seeing where it might be easier to go to a different country, um, but that's also being squeezed and squeezed and squeezed, so eventually the idea is that you know, we'll find the, the, the balance and that you, you know, it, it won't be so easy to kind of move between countries because we'll all be playing across the same level playing field. Um, but you know, keep innovating, and, and crypto is here to stay. I think that's finally kind of gotten uh, through to many regulators, and, and that's exciting. I mean, and come work in compliance. It's the sexiest job in town, um, and, and I think it's the best place to be. Yeah, we've certainly come a long way from the early days of the conferences where even the, the people on the panel couldn't decide what it is. You know, is it a security? Is it income? Is it property? Uh, you know, what is it? And, and while we, we are moving forward in inches with, with regard to the regulation, uh, we're moving in huge, huge leaps and bounds with how many people are actually interacting with crypto today. And as the space continues to grow, when we look at the, the criminal illicit activity, it's still only about like 0.062% you know, of all of the crypto that's out there. And so the amount of criminal activity is small in comparison to criminal activity that occurs with fiat currency. But whatever amount is out there, we, we need to come up with ways to try to prevent uh, cryptocurrency from being used for illicit activities. And you know, as Liad, uh, you know, has said, and, and I would would say, there are many, many tools out there, and take advantage of them, and uh, keep the industry growing. Right. I, I agree. Also, that uh, cash is still king with regard to illicit activities. Um, I guess my little parting thought would be: um, after Shapeshift announced that that we were decentralizing, I got hit hit up a lot by people wanting the how-to guide. <laughs> to decentralize a company, which of course did not exist. Um, but, I, but, but just so everyone knows, it's a really complicated, you know, plodding sort of process that you have to think through every aspect clearly um, and, and should not be undertaken lightly at all. 
So I, I, so I think, you know, this is a regulation panel. So to sum it up, regulation's coming, uh, enforcement's coming. Regulation is good if it's done, if it's done uh, properly. Um, I think that's what we all want, and we're all here to, to try to move the industry in the right direction. And if it's done properly, then you'll get an infl influx and inflow of institutions that'll participate in the market that aren't currently participating. I mean, crypto historically from the beginning has been a retail kind of product. Institutions haven't really gotten involved because there has been a gray area of regulations. They don't feel comfortable. Many of them can't even invest in it until there is regulations. And so doing it right, I think, is good for the industry. Uh, but again, it's a learning curve for, the, for today's regulators. Drew, can I add one quick point that just stimulated from, from Veronica's piece, which is that um, you know, cash is still king, but I think crypto's court jester. And I, th I think that's really exciting for us. And my two closing words, number one, educate. Educate yourself, educate your regulator, and edu educate your legislator. And number two, take what you know and use it to innovate. I see way too many cash grabs and way too many things out in the industry that I'm not proud of. We can all do better. We're all here because we want to see this technology and these products and services thrive and succeed. Use this knowledge for good. Thank you to Liat and Mary Beth and Veronica and Jeff, and thank you all for being a great crowd. All right. Thank you, panel.